President of the Ludwig von Mises Institute in Auburn, Alabama, and Vice President of the Center for Libertarian Studies in Burlingame, California. He's the editor of six books and the author of thousands of articles appearing in journals, magazines, newspapers, as well as a commentator for radio and television. He is the editor of what is arguably the finest daily libertarian newsletter on the internet, lewrockwell.com. Um, as many of you know, we publish a daily newsletter called the FFF Email Update. And as much as I love it, I have to say that the very first one I go to look for every day is lewrockwell.com. It's an absolute inspiration for advocates of liberty all over the world. Please welcome Lou Rockwell. Well, what an honor it is to be here with Bumper and with all of you and with the Future of Freedom Foundation. Uh, how well I remember um, right after 9-11, there was a very small band of libertarians who stood up to the immediate announcement of a police state and uh, um, it was Bumper and the Future of Freedom Foundation, David Thoreau, and the Independent Institute also uh, uh, took the right side. Most were silent. Some uh, actually took the side of government and called on government to be strengthened libertarians. So, uh, Bumper, you're a hero. I'm going to talk about war and inflation. The U.S. Central Bank, called the Federal Reserve, was created in 1913. No one promoted this institution with the slogan that it would make wars more likely and guarantee that nearly half a million Americans would die in battle in foreign lands, not to speak of many millions of foreigners. No one pointed out this, that this institution would permit Americans to fund without taxes the destruction of so many cities abroad and the overthrow of governments at will. No one said that the central bank would make it possible for the U.S. to be at war, large-scale war, in one of every four years in the full century, and at small-scale war every single year. It was never pointed out that this institution would make it possible for the U.S. government to establish a global empire that would make Imperial Rome and Imperial Britain look benign by comparison. You can line up a hundred professional war historians and political scientists and talk about the 20th century, and not one is likely to mention the role of the Fed in funding U.S. militarism. And yet it is true. The Fed is the institution that has created the money to fund the wars. In this role, it has solved a major problem that the state has confronted in all of human history. A state without money, or a state that must simply tax its citizens to raise money for its wars, is necessarily limited in its imperial ambitions. Keep in mind that this is only a problem for the state. It is not a problem for the people. The inability of the state to fund its unlimited ambitions is worth more for the people than every kind of legal check and balance. It is more valuable than all the constitutions ever devised. The state, remember, has no wealth of its own. It is not a profitable enterprise. Everything it possesses, must, it, it must take from society in a zero-sum game. This usually means taxes, but taxes annoy people. They have the potential to destabilize the state and to threaten its legitimacy. They inspire anger, revolt, and even revolution. Rather than risk that result, the state, before the dawn of the central banking era, was somewhat cautious in its global ambitions, simply because it was cautious in its need to steal directly and openly from the people in order to pay its bills. Now, to be sure, it does not require a central bank for a state to choose inflation over taxes as a means of funding itself. All it really requires is a monopoly on the production of money. Once acquired, 
The monopoly on money production leads to a systematic process of depreciating the currency, whether by coin clipping or debasement or the introduction of paper money, which can then be printed without limit. The central bank assists in this process in a critical sense. It cartelizes the banking system as the essential conduit by which new money is lent to the public and to the government itself. The banking system thereby becomes a primary funding agency for the state, and in exchange for its services, the banking system is guaranteed against insolvency and business failure as it profits from inflation. If the goal of the state is the complete monopolization of money under an infinitely flexible paper money system, there is no better path for the state than the creation of a central bank. This is the greatest achievement in the victory or for the victory of power over liberty. The connection between war and inflation then dates long before the creation of the Federal Reserve. In fact, it dates in our own country to the founding itself and even before in the colonial era. But the fate of the continental currency during and after the Revolutionary War, when famously the slogan became, not worth a continental, was a very bad omen for the future. The war had to be fought, the money had to be raised, the currency was the victim, and the whole country paid a very serious price. It was this experience that later led to the gold clause in the US Constitution. Except for the Hamiltonians, the entire generation of political activists saw the unity of freedom and sound money and regarded paper money as the fuel of tyranny. Consider Thomas Paine, quote, paper money is like dram drinking. It relieves for a moment by deceitful sensation, but gradually diminishes the natural heat and leaves the body worse than it found it. Were this not the case, and could, be money, and could money be made of paper at pleasure, every sovereign in Europe would be as rich as he pleased. Paper money appears at first sight to be a great thing, a great saving, or rather that it costs nothing, but it is the dearest money there is. The ease with which it is admitted by an assembly at first serves as a trap to catch people in at last. It operates as an anticipation of the next year's taxes." Unquote. But the wisdom of this generation, under attack um, continually over, the, over American history, was finally thrown out entirely during the Progressive Era. It was believed that in an age of scientific public policy, the country needed a scientific monetary machinery that could be controlled by powerful elites. The dawn of the age of central banking in our country was also the dawn of the age of central planning, for there can be no government control over the nation's commercial life without first controlling the money. And once the state has the money and the banking system, its ambitions can be realized. Before the creation of the Federal Reserve, the idea of American entry into the conflict that became World War I would have been inconceivable. In fact, it was a highly unpopular idea and Woodrow Wilson himself campaigned on a platform that promised to keep us out of war. But with a money monopoly, all things seemed possible. It was a mere four years after the, the founding of the Fed, after it was invented under the guise of scientific policy planning, the real agenda became obvious. The Fed would fund US entry into World War I. It was not only entry alone that was made possible, World War I was the first total war. It involved nearly the whole of the civilized world, and not only their governments, but also the civilian populations, both as combatants and targets. It has been described as the war that ended civilization in the 19th century sense by which we understand that term. That is to say, it was the war that ended liberty as we knew it. What made it possible was the Federal Reserve. And not only the US Central Bank, it was also its European counterparts. This was a war funded under the guise of scientific monetary policy. Reflecting on the calamity of this war,